Welcome to the Boston Spark Meetup. My name is Nick. I'm one of the organizers for the meetup. Um, if you didn't notice, there's pizza out there. Or maybe there, maybe there isn't anymore. And the bathrooms are over to that side. Feel free to step out anytime you need them. So uh, I'll just go over a quick, uh, some quick opening remarks, some updates about what's going on in the, the Spark ecosystem, <clears throat> and then I'll quickly hand it over to our feature speaker for tonight. Um, so, uh, quick updates. Yes. So these are just random things that you may or may not be interested in that are going on in the Spark ecosystem right now. Uh, the uh, voting is happening right now on Spark 2.0.2, so if you have any like burning bug fixes you're really dying to see in the next release, it would be a good idea to go check out uh, the release candidate there and leave your comments on the dev list. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about when I say dev list and release candidate? Anyway, it's the process by which the, the Spark developers, the core developers, they prepare code base for a release where they get a stamp it with a release version. And there's usually a round of voting. And if somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, you're about to release a new version of Spark, but there's a critical regression. There's a new bug you just added. They'll stop the release for things like that. And they need users basically to give them that kind of feedback when they do this, this voting. So hopefully by, uh, I don't know, Mid this month, mid November, we'll have Spark 2.02, and they're also planning on cutting the branch for Spark 2.1. Um, so yeah, I don't know how, how many people here have ever contributed to Spark itself. I'm just curious if you have any Spark contributors. Oh, nobody. Oh, okay. Well, all right. So I won't go too much detail there. Then. All right. So anyway, that's the thread from the dev list that I have up on the screen just to show you what that is. Another thing I wanted to just call out for the general community is probably sometime next year, uh, Spark will be dropping support for Scala 2.10, probably also Python 2.6, and Java 7. Um, so they're still debating it, you know, and kind of like what's the correct timing for this, and you know, how many more users are still using these versions of languages. <coughs> Maybe it'll be pushed back to late next year or the year after, but they're already actively discussing it. Again, if you have any people, especially if you're on-premises, and you have some kind of cluster that's, you know, uh, I don't know, like a pre-Madonna cluster that nobody can touch and can't upgrade it, and you really need Java 7 support for a long time, you might want to chime in on those discussions. So what's the native language? What's the native language? That's, that Spark is written in? Out the job plan. Oh, it'll be, it'll be 2.11. It'll be, you know, what, what, what Spark requires or what, what Spark is written in. Scala 2.11. Uh, and they'll add support for Scala 2.12. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's still Scala. Yeah, yeah. These are just the versions of the languages. Yeah. All right. Um, <coughs> other tidbits uh, I wanted to point out. Just quick things from the community. Um, oh, sorry. This one, this one. Um, there's currently a bunch of work going on to make Spark pip installable. How many people here use Python as their primary development language and with Spark? Yeah. So this might be a really nice thing. Uh, so we have Holden Corral uh, working on, on this PR that you can see open here. It's going to take quite a bit of work, but maybe by Spark 2.1 or 2.2, uh, you'll be able to pip install Spark and put in your requirements.txt file and say what version you depend on uh, and stuff like that. It'll be, it'll, it should be a nice improvement to the packaging and the workflow for uh, Python developers who use Spark. <coughs> Another update, uh, this is kind of esoteric, but I wonder how many people here have ever used the monotonically increasing ID function in Spark. Does anybody know what that's about? All right, I'll, I won't spend too much time then. But basically it had a bunch of non-deterministic behavior that they're finally coming around to fixing so that you can actually depend on the IDs that are sped up by that stupid function. So that's, that should be a nice proof of the people who thought they could use this function for something useful, but it turned out not to be the case. Uh, and my final update, is about Spark Summit Europe, which just happened like a couple of weeks ago. Um, all of the uh, talks are going to be uploaded to YouTube and freely available, just like every Spark Summit. You know, we had Spark Summit East and Spark Summit West earlier this year. Those videos are already up. And the talks for Spark Summit Europe will probably be up within the next week or two, the slides as well. And there's always just a wealth of great information about the latest developments in Spark itself and how various people within the industry from around the world are using Spark and their use cases and what they found, the problems they had. 
So if you've never you know, taken a look at any of these Spark Summit pages and the videos, I, I highly recommend it. You'll never know what you might learn. There might be a talk by a company that you find interesting or by a person that you know. Um, so uh, that's it. Those are my quick updates. Um, and I want to thank IBM today for both hosting us and paying for the pizza. So just let's get up for IBM. second event I think that they've hosted here and we really appreciate IBM's support. All right, and so now I'll just turn over to our, our speaker, Joe, who's also from IBM. Uh, and Joe's going to be talking about decision trees in Apache Spark. Uh, so just to add a couple notes uh, to what Nick said, Spark Summit East, you never know where it's going to be next year? Right here. Yeah, it's here in Boston. Uh, I don't know what hotel or convention center you guys have. I'm not sure yet. I emailed uh, the people that organized it, and they said, I got no response. So there's only like five hotels or places I can hold it. So hopefully we get to be in one of those. Um, so just some uh, ground rules to start. The slides and the code, the notebook, are going to be available on this URL. So GitHub, uh, Joseph Kamrock is IBM slash meetup. And I'll put this up after. I'll put it on the meetup page. So you don't need to take photos of anything or copy down slides uh, or anything like that. So you'll have access to everything. Uh, also, interrupt me when you have questions. Uh, it's better when I get interrupted, because I can talk for like six hours, but no one needs that, no one wants that. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, interrupt me. Uh, if I'm not talking loud enough, tell me you're not talking loud enough. There's a microphone I can use if uh, need be. Uh, all right. So, uh, the motivation for this talk was that I didn't know decision trees in Spark, and I thought, what better way to motivate me than to be in front of about 80 people needing to know it. So this forced me to learn how to do it. I've done decision trees in R before, uh, but this is sort of just a different way to do it. Uh, the good news is I did learn how to do it. I made slides, I made codes, so you all get to see that. Uh, so uh, it'd be really interesting to talk if I said, well, I didn't learn it, so. Uh, there were things that I did, and I'll talk about those as well. So, uh, the agenda is we're going to do a quick bio, we're going to talk about IBM a little bit, uh, we're going to look at decision trees, uh, sort of the algorithm, then we're going to look at decision trees in Spark, and then we'll open up a notebook uh, and do that. So the first question I have is, do I look like an IBM? No? <laughs> no? Okay, good. That's the answer I was hoping for uh, when I gave this talk. Uh, the other question I have is, do I look like a sales guy? <laughs> <laughs> Not a sales guy. I bought pizza. That's as close to a sales guy as I get. Uh, and the strange thing is, I am an IBM sales guy. Uh, and this doesn't make any sense to me. If you told me uh, six months ago you're going to be an IBM sales guy, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, if you told me two years ago, I don't think I would have believed you either. So why am I an IBM sales guy? Well, it's because IBM made a huge investment in Spark. And I'm really a Spark guy. I've been using Spark. Uh, for over a year now uh, in lots of different places. And then when IBM decided they were going to go all in on Spark, they made a huge investment. I'll talk about some of that. They went on a hiring spree. So I was one of about 15 hires that one manager had. Uh, so I was really fortunate in that case. And, and in a true IBM fashion, they reorged me on the second day. So my hiring manager was not my actual manager. I had her for a manager for one day. Uh, my manager at IBM is a lifelong IBMer who has never managed before. So I started this job with a manager with less management experience than me, but it was working with Spark. And it was working in open source. I have this horrible job title. It's open source and analytics technical evangelist. And that's about as bad a job title as you can get. It doesn't even fit on business terms. Uh, and I don't like saying it, but the key thing there is that it's open source analytics. I have about six years with R, uh, Hadoop related technologies and those kinds of things. I actually hate IBM's proprietary tools. I've gotten into more arguments with SPSS sellers than you care to believe. Uh, so I don't like proprietary tools, I don't like uh, MATLAB, I don't like SAS or any of these things. They're, they're very nice products, I'm sure, but I like open source. That's really where I focus my time and energy. So I sort of bought into this uh, IBM change where they're going all in on Spark. And there's three main parts to it. So they're working on the portfolio, and there's about 3,500 employees working on Spark-related topics at IBM. And that's a huge amount of people. If you think about that in comparison to other companies that work on Spark, 
There aren't three and a half thousand people at Databricks. There aren't three and a half thousand people at Cloud Era. There's not that many people at uh, Hortonworks or anywhere else. So we do have the largest number of people in one company working on Spark. Uh, we also opened this uh, Spark Technology Center. It's in San Francisco, and the goal was to hire 300 engineers for this. That is a lot of engineers. Do you know how hard it is to hire 300 engineers to work on Spark for IBM? It's actually impossible. Uh, so we haven't done it. We've tried to hire 300 engineers. We've hired about 80, which is a pretty good number. Uh, if you think about it, if you had to hire 300 engineers, that's so many interviews, so many code tests, uh, relocation, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we've already actually seen one of the engineers we hired. Uh, Nick talked earlier about Holden uh, working on pip install. Uh, Holden is an IBM engineer that works at the Spark Technology Center. Uh, we contributed uh, some machine learning and system ML, and we also partnered with Databricks. And then there's also focus on the community. Uh, so uh, we have some courses that I'll talk about, and things like this, do we meet us? This is part of the community. So why is IBM doing this? Does anyone have any guesses why they're doing this speculation? To make money. Yeah, it's to make money. <coughs> and, but it's kind of a roundabout way to make money. So the idea here is if more people use Spark, IBM has a bigger client pool. If more people use Spark, well, we end up using Spark also. And we'll see some of that. And then we'll see, OK, everyone benefits from it. So this is a picture of the technology center. And this is just some of the engineers that work there. Uh, so there's a physical location. If you want to go learn about Spark, have a Spark client meeting, it's out in San Francisco. Uh, you can go there and see that. Uh, and then the big, big, big contribution, the thing that actually matters a lot is how much code we are contributing. So first we have Databricks, and that's what we expect. Databricks pretty much invented Spark. It's a company built solely to monetize Spark. IBM was built as a company to like sell adding machines in the 1900s or uh, something. But we're actually second. Um, and second, and a bigger contribution than sort of the next five. So I think that's really impressive. And about a little over a year, we're one of the second largest contributors. Who's NTT? Is that a Japanese company? NTT? I have no idea. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. Japanese 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 Nip Japanese. Nippon Telephone Talk. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so they're contributing. But IBM with a pretty big contribution. Uh, the majority of this is bug fixes. We don't have a lot of uh, committers because there's only so many committers and they tend to be uh, in database. But you can actually look down at it. It's a lot of bug fixes, which are just as important as writing new code. And again, the reason we want to improve Spark is because we actually use it in our products. So Spark is under the hood in SPSS. It's also under the hood in Big Insights. We use it on Bluemix. And we use it in Watson Health. So if Spark gets better, IBM's products get better. So that's really how they're trying to monetize this uh, investment in Spark. Is Watson Health separate from Watson, like, I don't know, Jeopardy Watson? Or the yeah, so Watson Health is a new sort of way to monetize the Watson from uh, Jeopardy. And there's people here from Watson Health that I met earlier. They're over there if you want to uh, talk to them. But they do some really interesting things because if you think about healthcare, it's a big data mining problem. And you want to do the same things you do in other analytic techniques. You have a certain amount of data, some historic data, and you want to predict outcomes. And Watson does a really nice job of doing that. And there's also a lot of peripheral things. Uh, healthcare is very, very tightly regulated, so it helps uh, manage a lot of the problems associated with that. So fostering the community, there's a website that IBM, uh, I guess, owns called Big Data University, and has free training on it. Uh, it has training on big data things, analytic things, Spark things, uh, and it's similar to an edX, uh, and there's course modules that you can take. So that's another contribution. There's also this interesting tool, Data Science Experience. Uh, right now it's free, and there's going to be a freemium version uh, available as well, and it's a really, really comprehensive data science tool. Uh, and again, it's free, so I don't know how much of a sales pitch this can actually be, uh, but check it out. There's um, some nice features where you can write Spark notebooks. Uh, so that's one thing I'll be demoing later. But it also connects to our studio as well. Uh, there's data sets on there. There's articles. Uh, so check it out. You don't uh, necessarily need to sign up. But uh, if you do, it's an interesting thing to play around with. Uh, it really does a nice job of uh, putting uh, notebooks in a browser. And I'll be showing that a little bit later. OK. Uh, 
Does anyone have any more questions about IBM? I don't. I hope not. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to decision trees. So there will be two parts. There's just decision trees in general, and then we'll look at decision trees in Spark. So. We end up doing decision trees underneath the hood in a lot of things we do in our own life. So this is a decision tree I often do in my head. And it is, should I take the green line? So when I think, should I take the green line, the first thing I do is I check the Red Sox schedule. And if there's a Red Sox game, then I'm staying home. I do not want to be on the train with thousands of drunk Red Sox fans. I'm a Red Sox fan, but I don't want to be on the train with them on the green line. So, when there's a home game, they play 81 home games, I stay home or I walk. Walking is usually faster than the green line anyways. <laughs> then, we have this split. So if there's no Red Sox game, then I want to ask the question, is it snowing? If it's snowing, well, I don't want to take the green line. I'm going to stay home or walk as well. But if it's not snowing, then you're okay taking the green line. But there's some key things to note here. We have these numbers here, 8 out of 10, 81 out of 81. This is our probability of making the correct, correct choice based on historic data. So the 81 out of 81, it's always bad to take the train when the Red Sox are flying. And 8 times out of 10, it's bad to take the train when it's snowing, but 2 times out of 10, it's okay. So we're mostly good on that type of classification. We're calling that, okay, stay home. And then, when we actually take the green line, it's good 250 times and then bad 274. And those are the times that is there's bad or total. Uh, this is the total and this is the no, okay. um, percent. So uh, it's bad the the what, 24 times. Percent. Yeah, those 24 times are when there's a band playing at Fenway that you didn't know about uh, and you get caught in that traffic. Uh, sometimes there's just random errors. Uh, there's when drivers don't show up. All these wonderful problems that we get to experience. And so this is a decision tree that I do in my head a lot. And you probably do similar things uh, when you uh, have these processes that you take. And underneath the hood, in a lot of customer service, when you call a help desk, they're going to say, OK, uh, what kind of operating system do you have? And then that'll funnel them into a different direction. So uh, very, very useful. The other nice thing, it's very easy to explain to like a manager or to a layperson. You don't have to talk about regression models. You don't have to talk about uh, Bayesian analysis, you can actually put this on a projector and almost anyone will understand this. It's not very difficult to understand, okay? Uh, Red Sox, yes, no. And they can follow a path through this tree. So some of the terminology in decision trees, we have a root node. That's sort of your top node, and that is, ends up being your most important question. And we'll look at that uh, in a little bit more detail as well. We have a split, and in this case we have a yes-no split. Are the Red Sox playing? Yes, no. You can have binary splits, but you can also have other kinds of splits. If you had a type of car, for example, you could have a split that went uh, truck, mid-size, compact. It doesn't have to be just two. A lot of the algorithms will restrict you to two, uh, and sometimes your data just has two. Uh, so the Red Sox are either playing or not playing. There's no maybe or anything like that. We also have terminal nodes. These are the nodes at the bottom where the tree ends. Uh, so in this case, we have three terminal nodes. We have a node label, and this is what we classify the node as. So here it's stay home or walk. That's our label for the node. Uh, here it's going to be green line. Take the green line as the label. And the label is going to be the thing you're trying to predict, the behavior you want to predict. Should you stay home or walk, or take the green line? We have node purity, which is, again, just this uh, percent. And then we have an internal node. So that's not a terminal node, but sort of an internal node we can say, all right, there's some behavior here. In this case, if we only had information on the Red Sox not playing, this node would just be the sum of these two. So it would be uh, the combination. Uh, any questions on this diagram? There's some other terminology. Sometimes these are called branches as well. Okay. So what are they? Decision trees are supervised learning tech. So this means that they're built from a data set that has a target variable, that has an answer already built in. Uh, so you can think of the, the data set like x1, x2, x3, and a y. And you're trying to predict that y based on historic data. There's two main types of decision trees. There's classification and regression. Classification ones are to assign a label. So the one we just saw was classification. 
The example we're going to see is a classification tree, but you could also do it with a regression if you wanted to predict something continuous. So if you had to predict uh, home value in Massachusetts, you could make a decision tree on that and you get some value, 800,000, 900,000, 1.1 million, those kinds of things. And the splits would be, uh, is it in Weston? Yes, no. Is it four bedrooms? Yes, no. And you follow those, that tree down, those paths, and then you get a home value. The input can be continuous or discrete, uh, and we'll look at that in our modeling. So continuous values, if you think about uh, square footage of a house, it's going to be continuous. Discrete is going to be more yes, no uh, type of things. Our output is that tree with the design flow, the decision flow. And we can turn that into rules. So the rule, if the Red Sox are playing, then stay home. And we can actually use these with probabilities if we just do this now. 80% probability that if the Red Sox aren't playing and it is snowing, we should stay home. So we can get probabilities from these models. Uh, but sometimes you're only concerned with the classification. Any questions here? Okay. So the general algorithm, and I pulled this off of the uh, Spark page. And uh, mm -hmm. does this make sense to anybody? Read it for a second. It's a bit mathy. So I generally have no idea what this means. Uh, there's all these like argmax igds, argmax igds. I have no clue what this is. So in English, what does this mean? The best way I can translate this is the algorithm tries to find the best splits. So then we get the question, what are the best splits? The best splits are the ones that separate the data well. And this isn't the sense that we're separating it into 50-50. We're separating the classifications. We're separating stay home, and take the green line. So anytime we can separate the data, then it's considered a good split. And we want to separate entirely. So uh, you can think of other examples for best splits if you asked uh, for home value. And you said, is it in uh, Weston? That's going to split the value into over a million dollars and under a million dollars pretty cleanly. So things like that are good splits. When you kind of get a muddle of answers, then it would be a bad split. So for taking the green line, uh, if your question was, do you need to be there in 45 minutes? Well, that's not really going to split your stay home or take the green line decision very much. Uh, again, this is sort of a weird mathy explanation. I have the citation, uh, but we'll look at sort of how we determine what the best splits are. Uh, so underneath that, there needs to be some kind of algorithm. So the algorithm ends up being uh, one of these three. This is how we determine what makes a good split. We're mostly going to focus on the first two, the classification. So we need a way to measure how good a split is. One way is with a Gini measure. And with this is this equation. So it's a feature times one minus the feature. So you can think of this as uh, something times its opposite. And when something times its opposite is pretty big, there's a good mix of things. If something times its opposite isn't big, there's not a good mix. Uh, and you can think of the same thing with entropy. So here we have a feature times a log of its feature. So when there's a mix of things, then we can split them up, and we're going to get information. There's some value. If you think about a string of numbers, if we have 15 zeros, there's not a good mix of numbers in that. It's really hard to encode anything. There's really just one thing, 15 zeros. So if we had a string that was 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, if there was a mix of things, then you can actually start encoding things, ASCII characters, and you have bytes there. So you want a mix. And when this is high, when there's a mix. So if it's all the same thing, you're going to have 1 times log of 1, nothing. If you have 1 times 1 minus 1, 0, nothing. But when there's a mix, then you get some information in so this deals a lot with sort of information theory. Anyone familiar like uh, the work uh, Shannon did about 70 years ago? Yeah. Information. So, and some of it comes from thermodynamics, but it's this idea of encoding information. And what we're going to do is we're going to count this for every single variable. If we count it for every single variable, we'll find the one that matters the most, the one that has the most information. In our case, that our, is the Red Sox plan. There's a lot of information encoded here. It gives us a lot of value in our split. 
For continuous decision trees, we just do a regression. So this is uh, a point minus the average squared, so uh, sum of squares. Uh, so under the hood, just does simple like linear regression, and then figures out, okay, what variable had a low p-value, what variable had a big impact, uh, and it does that under the hood. Um, any questions on information? Yeah. <clears throat> Could you explain what a feature is? Like, are there columns and you have tables or oh, okay. samples and the columns are features? Or? So the question is, what's a feature? You can think of it as just a variable. Uh, so in a data set, if you have home value, it's going to be number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, square footage, any kind of variable. You can think of it as x1, x2, so you have x3. An example that's <clears throat> someone sold this home, had this many, a column, this many rooms, this many bathrooms. This, this yeah, is, this you can think of it as a column. And you'll do that for every single column. You'll count up the information for every single variable. So when the algorithm goes through and does all that counting, and sees which value is uh, the most informative, it's going to say, OK, split all the data on that column. So all of the Red Sox playing on one side, the Red Sox not playing on the other side. So that's how we get our split. And then we do the same thing all over again. We look at all the data in this subset of the data, and we find out what value has the most information. In this case, it would be, is it snow? And we'll do the same thing on this step with that subset of the data. When we figure out that, we get another split and another split. And it'll keep splitting until we get to some stopping condition. So it's a big loop where we count the data here, do a split, subset the data, count the data here, do a split, and it's a loop. And what is Spark really, really good at? These kinds of iterative looping functions. Because a lot of this data is going to be held in memory. <coughs> when we split it, we're just going to do two partitions. So underneath the hood, it just creates two different RDDs of the data. Uh, and then we just repeat until their stopping conditions are purity. So in our Red Sox example, we couldn't split anymore. We had perfect uh, diagnostic, perfect labeling in this case <coughs> of stay home. So there's no splits in those cases. But here, with is it snowing with a no, we, there was a way to split the data. So the nice thing is, the algorithm does a lot of this under the hood for us. We don't have to write these kind of loops and splits and subsets or anything like that. Uh, any questions on how the algorithm kind of works under the hood? All right, and a lot of that math that we saw here, this is pretty simple counting problems. We just count the feature probabilities and then multiply. Not really heavy math there. Uh, as far as implementation, this math ends up being a little bit simpler, so it ends up being a little bit faster than doing logs. With, uh, okay, how do we evaluate these models? So we can do uh, test data and then tr uh, training set, test set. We can look at the ROC curve, so a pretty typical type of classifier evaluation. Uh, we can look at a confusion matrix. The most important thing is, does the split make sense? Can you understand it? Can you explain it? Is it intuitive? What do the domain experts say? And then, how deep is the tree also? You can overfit the tree. If you were to ask 80 questions, you'll be right a lot of the time. If you had to ask, uh, say one question, are you this person, are you that person, are you that person, you're going to get very, very specific answers, but it's not going to be an easily generalizable model. Uh, so be concerned about how deep the tree is. How do you um, know when you've, when you've made something that's overfit? Is that what these you know, earlier attributes tell you the ROC and the confusion matrix and so forth? These just tell you how well you're classifying on your data. So these you can get up to 100%, but... Uh, and still have something that's overfit. Yeah, and generally if you get 100% classification, you're overfitting your data. Uh, so ways to see if there's very few members in the terminal nodes. If the terminal node is like two out of two or three out of three, you're generally asking too many questions. If the tree is really deep, if there's uh, six layers to the tree. It can be overfit. Uh, and there's some trade-off. As you fit to your training set, you're going to get worse and worse and worse to your test set. So it's a matter of balancing those out. So decision trees in Spark. So within Spark, decision trees are part of the 
mllib and machine learning package or library. This package has a lot of stuff, uh, not just about decision trees, but about regressions and k-means, uh, collaborative filtering. So it's really, really rich uh, library. Uh, and mllib also it kind of encompasses two things: the mllib package and the ml. Uh, anyone know the distinction or familiar with them? ML is the data frame based replacement for the RDD based MLlib. Yeah. So ML is for data frames and MLlib is for RDD. So MLlib is a little bit older. Uh, it turns out there's pretty heavy overlaps still. And I think that MLlib is sort of the umbrella term that ML falls into. So here's the function, and I hate to show a lot of code-y type things, but we're going to go over it. Uh, and I think this is really important to understand how, for, how you can build these in the future. Uh, so we have our function. Uh, in this case, I did it in Python. Uh, so pyspark.mllib.tree.decisiontreeclassifier. And then we have these arguments. Data, young classes, categories, and features. And we'll go into these one. Uh, so I, Note here, I did do it in Python. That's the language I'm more comfortable with. And I think, uh, who here prefers Python to Scala? Okay, so I got most of them. Who here prefers Scala? Anyone like Java? Eight? One? All right. I never understand that. <laughs> okay, so the arguments. The most important one is our data. And this is our training set. And there's a weird thing that is required here. And this is the training data needs to be an RDD of labeled point. I've never heard of labeled point in my life. <coughs> Has anyone heard of labeled point before Spark? No, because it didn't exist before Spark. So labeled point is a very, very specific format. It is a uh, key value pair of a label and then a vector of features. So it's a very, very specific file format, and we'll see how to get it into that format. There's thankfully a function called label point that will create label point RDDs. Uh, but you can think of it as you have a dependent variable, in this case, uh, the one, and then the independent variables are in array. Uh, so three, and then four, one, five, six, seven. <coughs> For some reason, the dependent variable needs to be a float. So in this case, in a classification, we can have Category 1, Category 2, Category 3. We can't have Category 1.5, but we still have a float holding. I don't understand this, uh, but we have to have a float. So in this case, 1.0 or uh, 0 is our classification, or 2. We can do multi-class classification with this. Sorry. Can you explain RDD? Oh, <coughs> so RDDs are the main data abstraction in Spark. They are resilient distributed data sets. You can think of it as a collection of elements. <coughs> Uh, they don't have to be anything in particular. Typically, they are just rows of data. In this case, our RDD row is this tuple, or key value, either one of those. Um, and that's yeah, resilient distributed data set. So main uh, data abstraction. Uh, okay. Uh, the function for doing this is called label point. And we'll see that again in the code. And it takes two arguments, a label and a feature. And again, it's used for supervised learning. We see here that it's part of the regression uh, package, and that's because uh, we end up having this kind of classifier. So dependent variable, and then all the independent variables there. Any questions on label point? That was the thing that threw me for a little uh, when I was practicing. Okay. None classes is just the number of classes when we're trying to classify. If we have a binary classifier, it's going to be uh, two, and the important note is don't use this for regression. Regression is for continuous, it's not going to be for number of classes. Categorical features info, this is a map of all of your categorical features and what they map to, and I found this a little bit cumbersome, so the, what I would recommend is just do all of your categorical variable changes before you get to the algorithm. I think it's a little bit more intuitive as part of the data cleansing process to do it that way, and I have it, an example in the code of that. But if you want, you can make this map of all of your categorical data. So if you had, um, let's say, for cars, you would have a map, car type maps to sedan, hatchback, SUV, and all those things. Impurity, this is our measurement of information. So it could be Ginny by default, 
or entropy, the one we saw with information and the log data. Uh, so Gini again is a measure of dispersion, it measures inequality. The most common use that you'll hear for Gini inequality is for countries. Countries with big income inequality have a higher Gini value. Uh, countries that are pretty flat have a lower uh, Gini value. Uh, and then entropy or randomness. Uh, this ends up being not too much different since you're basically measuring the same thing. Some kind of difference in the data. Max depth. So this is something that we can control to prevent overfitting. So this is the depth of our tree. The larger the max depth value, the more likely we are to overfit. So this sort of tells you how big your tree is going to be. Uh, and then max bins. This is a different one. So when we do splits, we end up saying, okay, how many categories do we want to put things into? And in this case, it's sort of a bin. So if you think of binning data, I know that Hive has binning, if anyone's familiar with uh, Apache Hive. And it's a very similar thing, where we're gonna take our data and put it into bins. So anything categorical, we're not gonna, uh, we're gonna need more bins than categories. So if we had a variable with 10 categories, we need at least 10 bins to measure in each bin how important each variable is. Uh, and then if we have something continuous, let's say for square footage of a home, we're gonna have from 10,000 to 10,000, uh, so 1,000 to 10,000. If we have 10 bins, it'll bin that into thousands. So it's just a way to break up categorical data. Uh, and also uh, continuous data. Min instances per node. This tells us how many members need to be in each node. So this will help us <coughs> overfit, uh, prevent overfitting because it'll prevent us from getting things like one member out of one in a terminal node. Uh, so you can increase this, and that'll prevent you from overfitting. Min info gain, uh, this is, well, do we want to control splits, how splits happen? The other things like max bins and max depth control, the depth of our split, this controls how we actually split. So maybe if there's not enough information in something, we're not going to split on it. Defaults to zero, but if you increase this, you'll see the tree from increasing this. So in Spark 2, uh, there is some other choices you need to make. So algorithm is one choice. So this is where we pick classification or regression. And that's a new feature in 2. Uh, so the Spark 1.6 didn't have the regression option. Uh, there's also subsampling, which is used for more advanced decision trees. And what we talked about, so in boosted or random forest. So in those algorithms, you end up sampling your tree. You end up not using all of the data. So in that case, you can set the rate. And then there's a max memory in database. This just controls your memory usage and what statistics you persist uh, when you do subsequent splits. And those are some other arguments you can make. So uh, it's time for a bad example. So I'm going to show you an example with no visualization of data. I'm not even going to look at variable correlation. There's not going to be a training set, there's not going to be a test set, I'm not going to validate the model, I'm not going to tune the model. So, why am I doing this? These are really more general machine learning techniques that aren't specific to decision trees. So, uh, hopefully everyone here knows how to split a data set into 70% training, 30% testing. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, value in me showing you that code of doing a random sampling. Uh, the visualization, uh, I. You can all visualize later. I don't want to show you 30 lines of code visualizing data or looking at correlations. Uh, and I don't want to start tuning the model, running 15 models at once um, to show you the best model. It's really just to get a flavor of what's going on and sort of an intro that you can then copy and paste, plug in your own data, and then from there, build your model. So uh, you can do the training and test set at a later time. There's no real back. And one of my examples works a lot better if I don't uh, break the data. But don't do this in a real setting. Don't do this uh, in showing one or telling one. So this is why I'm very upfront. Because uh, I know if I didn't have this slide, people were going to say, like, where's the training set? Where's the test set? So I'm saying, no, I'm not doing any of No visualization. This is like as lazy as it can get. Uh, but do these apply to every single machine learning technique? Uh, so I'm going to work. In the Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter is a really nice open source project that lets you work with Python, work with R, work with Scala, and it provides uh, an environment where you have code and markdown and output, and it ends up presenting really nicely uh, 
uh, I've seen presentations where people just show like a Python script, and it's a nightmare to look at. And then they run through it line by line. It doesn't work. Uh, so this will hopefully be much, much nicer. And again, an open source project, if anyone's interested, uh, they can contribute. So, this is my notebook, uh, and it's in the data science experience. So here I just have, um, this is quick, I have like recent items, so I have different notebooks there, I can kind of just do if I want it. Uh, so, uh, it's already been run, but if you want, there's like a way to edit it, there's a feature for sharing. Uh, there's version controlling, which is actually pretty nice in a tool. So here's our notebook, and first step. Is that easy to read? It's all right, yeah. It's all right. Okay. So our first step is we're going to load in our libraries. So we have our decision tree libraries, we have that label point function, and then we have an encoding, a couple of encoding functions. Then we're going to start our Spark session. So this is a new feature in two, where you don't have an SQL context uh, and then like a streaming context. It's all just part of the Spark session. Uh, so we start our Spark session. And then other nice thing about notebooks is that there's already assumed to be this Spark backend that it's connected to. So you don't have to initialize um, Spark or import all the Spark uh, by first. So we have our Spark session SC. Then we're going to load our data in. So the data that we're working with is the uh, South African heart disease data set from Hastie's uh, Elements of Statistical Learning. Is anyone familiar with it? A couple people. Uh, so this is a data set I chose because I happen to just have it on my laptop. Uh, but it fit, it fit our needs. It had categorical data, had uh, continuous data, and it had a target variable. So I have that data file. It's up on GitHub. Uh, with all the other things, so you can copy this example uh, as well. You don't need to go find the CSV. Uh, so our first line is just we're doing a wget. So this is just a bash command to go up on the web, find that data file, that CSV, and store it in local. So the tool, Data Science Experience, has some local storage. You have about five gigs of storage, uh, so you can pull the data in. Uh, there's other ways you can pull data in if you want to open an ODBC connection uh, or uh, connect to like an AWS file store, all this kind of stuff. I find this is the simplest because it's one line of code. Uh, so just a wget. And then we're going to read the data. So we have this uh, Spark session, uh, read.csv. So this is a little bit different. When you did a read CSV in 1.6, it would, you'd have to use like the Databricks uh, specific read.csv. So this is a lot cleaner. Uh, read.csv, we give it the local file name. <coughs> And we tell it the header is true. So that just tells us that there's columns associated with this. And what this does is actually it reads it in as a data frame called raw data. So let's examine the data. To do this, we're actually going to use pandas. Uh, so the Python library pandas. It has some, a really nice function in Spark called two pandas, and it prints it as a Python uh, data frame, a pandas data frame. And this is that same idea of data frame that we have in R. Uh, that's not been adopted in Spark as well. So just to look at the data, we see that we have some variables here. We have uh, blood pressure, tobacco, cholesterol, uh, adiposity, which I don't remember. I'm not a doctor. Uh, and I don't go to the doctor either, so I really don't know a lot of these terms. Um, family history. Uh, so this one we notice is a categorical variable. Uh, we have type A personality. Obesity, alcohol, age, and then our target variable, uh, chronic heart disease. So one represents heart disease, zero represents not heart disease. So this data set should be somewhat intuitive. If we see lots of tobacco and alcohol, we would imagine there's going to be heart disease. This is why we can't have things like tobacco and alcohol, because it's bad for our heart. Uh, family history, we would imagine, has some uh, relevance on heart disease as well. So we have our data there, and there's about uh, 500 rows or so, so uh, 462. So it tells us a nice uh, summary. Any questions so far? There's a nice function called columns that will print all of our column names. Uh, and then uh, if we want to print the schema, there's a print schema. 
And if we look at this, we have a problem. Everything is a string. Um, so we don't want strings. We have continuous values, right? Numbers. So we're going to have to do a conversion. This is that data cleansing part uh, that ends up taking most of the time. And a lot of this uh, work I did was just cleaning the data, figuring out the functions to clean the data. And most of the work you do in analysis is cleaning the data. Right? Uh, there's the, the comment. 80% of data analysis is cleaning the data, 20% is complaining about cleaning the data. <laughs> and I always hear, when I talk to customers, is there a good way to clean this data? Is there a tool that will let us do this? Is there a faster way to do this? Is there a repeatable way to do this? And unfortunately, there isn't. Uh, I worked with an uh, insurance company, and I said, like, what do you guys do? What's the cool models you build? What's some cool facts that you found? I want to know things like uh, yellow Lamborghinis always get in an accident or uh, 92 civics uh, last forever, things like that. They told me the data is messy. That was all I knew. They said the data is messy because there's 92 Camry, 92 Camry LS, 92 Camry SE, and all they do is claim the data, and they don't know anything about what happens. So uh, everyone just ends up claiming the data a lot of the time. So a lot of this code ends up being claiming the data. So there's a function uh, that the documentation is linked in here. So it's called with column, and it lets you work with data frames. And what you do is you tell it the column that you want, and then what you want to do with it. So in this case, we're going to take our blood pressure column and then cast it as a float, since it's a number. And then we just keep doing this with column, with column, with column. And because it's Python uh, and Spark, we can chain all these methods together and do it for every single variable. So we do that, uh, we cast things as floats, uh, and then uh, type A we cast as an int, uh, and age we cast as an int also. So now we're sort of cleaning the data. Uh, so then we're going to print the schema and check. So here we see, all right, we have some floats and ints here. We still have that string for family history. And what we end up doing with family history is just recoding <coughs> it as family history index, so 0 and 1. And that's what this string indexer uh, function does. So it takes an input column, turns it into categorical or indicator variables, dummy variables, those kinds of things. Uh, if you're used to R, R does this all for you. Here we have to actually encode it. Yes? Is there an inference for automatic inference of uh, the variable types? Uh, maybe. This, so what this does is it looks at every case. So family history, it only sees two things absent and present, and it calls it one and zero. Uh, and, we'll, and I'll show you that. Uh, if you had all different kinds of spellings, it's going to create all different kinds of categories. But if you have absent with a lowercase a, absent with a capital A, it's going to make it two different categories. Uh, so you could probably do some uh, uppers and lowers, but in this case, the data set was pretty clean. Uh, there wasn't a yeah, uh, I don't mean the automatic version of strings to flows that appropriate. Uh, oh, string to float, you can't. You shouldn't do because a lot of times the string is maybe it's encoded in ASCII, and if you turn that into a float, it's going to do something like it. Um, I mean, when you're reading the data, it's in the string format. So oh, there may be an argument. CSV doesn't convert them on that. Yeah. Was, or it does, and it does. Yeah. Um, I didn't see an argument for that, but there may very well be. At the very least, this is a good exercise. Uh, it certainly taught me about the with columns function, and now all of you know about the with columns. Uh, so, then I'm going to print some of the data, and this is what the native print uh, in Spark does. This is the show, and we see it's not as nice as that pandas, two pandas data frame that we saw. Here it kind of says, like, all right, we're going to have this wacky output with pluses and dashes. We still get our columns, and we see that we now have that index one. Uh, so we have uh, heart disease and then fan test index. A little bit easier to see there. So here we see what present is one, absent is zero. So it encoded that as a float for us. So that's what uh, this string indexer did. We ended up having to transform the data. Okay, and now we see fam history is a double, and we call that fam history not encoded. So more cleaning the data. Uh, we want to get rid of that family history, and we want to get it in a slightly better format for that labeled point. So we're just going to do a select. So 
we took our clean data, and we're going to select the columns. Uh, heart disease, blood pressure, so on. We drop family history, and we keep family history index, and then we turn it into an array. So you can target very low history of load? Yes. And I have no idea why. Does anyone know why? No idea. It can only be discrete. It can't be 1.5, it can't be 1.5006. Someone wrote this function and said it has to be a float. This is the beauty of open source, is that there's stuff that makes no sense that you can't find, and we're going to run into that later as well. Uh, but the nice thing is, if you want, it's an open source project, you can rewrite it all, submit it, <laughs> uh, and then IBM will hire you. If you're, if you're submitting code to the Spark project, uh, we'll open a rack for you. We made that 300 engineer number. We'll get hired. <coughs> we hired a, a Spark committer, and like it was a company-wide announcement. I got an email about it. So uh, they'll, they'll love it. And the salary's good, too, uh, as well. All right. Uh, so then that labeled point. So here we just do straight RDD map. So we're going to take in that argument x. So x is just each row. And then we're going to do label point with the first argument, heart disease, is there. And then we have an array of the remaining arguments. So one on. So now, if we print the first value, we have a, an element or row of labeled point. We see a float and then an array for our features. So this is our label and features. OK. Any questions up to that? All right, let's build our model. So we have this model creation, and we're going to do decision tree classifier, the data that we just created. There's two classes. In this case, heart disease or not heart disease. We're going to, um, we got rid of the categorical features. We did the encoding. So I didn't talk, the, the not classes, which is two. And you said it's heart disease or no heart disease. The algorithm doesn't know that, right? Yeah, so it's telling it, we want you to do your work, but someone end up with two classes. And we are hoping, how, how do we know it's going to end up with that kind of position? Um, or how do, we, how do we guide it in that direction? So, so we, we make sure everything in the target, the label, is one or zero, and then we tell it two. If it doesn't match, I have no idea what happens. Uh, but this is where you need to be responsible as an analyst and make sure that it matches. So make sure that there's two targets, heart disease, not heart disease, and then we tell it there's two classes, heart disease, not heart disease. Okay, one question. So I see the data tree, so you're putting all the data in the tree, and like the yep. not split and keep it. Yeah, bad example. So never do this. Yeah, but is there any functions to do that sort of test tree and split into that? Um, yeah. yeah, you could do like a random sampling of 70 and 30 percent. Uh, in the Spark documentation, there's some links to do that um, that you could just copy paste. Actually, in, in Spark tool and the new ML pipelines, they do have uh, specific classes, mm -hmm. one for a training validation split. Another one with a cross validator uh, framework that does train a whole bunch of models with different hyperparameters and picks them for you. But that's all in, in the M in the data frame only API. So the ML. ML, not ML. Do you need to throw set our seed in the beginning? Uh, no, there's no um, randomness. So it's, a, it's a random. The forward is a random. Uh, no, this just looks at all the data. There's no. We're not doing anything random. We're counting every single column and every single row of uh, If we were going to do that 70-30 split, then we could do a set mm -hmm. uh, But again, it's a bad example, um, and I just sort of wanted to cut that out. That's a great point, mm -hmm. and we're going to address that in the next code block. I see some Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll see it in my comments. It says that. We did impurity as Ginny, and we have our max depth as three, and our max bin as five. So this is our, pr we print the tree. So model dot two bug, two T bug string. And it's crap, it's bullshit. And then you, this doesn't make any sense. Else feature seven greater than 49, if feature eight less than zero, zero. This makes no sense, right? No, so there are some other things, like this feature two, which is smaller than 3.9, yeah. predict zero, bigger, also predict zero. 
Yeah, it's not. So you can just skip the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So are each of those features one of those columns that yeah. we looked at earlier? So we'd have to go back. So this is pretty horrible. Uh, and this is actually my big problem with this uh, function, is that it's crap. I can't read this. So right there. Not exactly easy to understand. Let's try to clean it up. So what I did was I replaced the features with the actual names. And I replaced that predict 1 and predict 0 with heart disease or healthy. So now it's a little bit better. Uh, so if obesity is less than 49, and then if also less than 28. So we're splitting multiple times on one variable. How does the algorithm uh, produce uh, an uninformative split like that? Uh, shouldn't the uh, impurity uh, be? Yeah, so if we increased the information, because remember mm -hmm. it defaults to zero, then it would prevent stuff like that. Uh, I think this is a great example, though, because it highlights something you were mentioning earlier about decision trees, which is that they are easy to explore and discuss. I mean, just just look at how many questions you know, because yeah. right? they can actually see what the model is is saying, unlike the logistic regression. Yeah, if we just had coefficients, they don't mean much. Right, right. right. Uh, now, my big complaint is that I had to, this is the cleaned up version, and I had to write all this code to make it English, and there's not a good way to reproduce this. There's no function that cleans that up. Uh, so the other thing that I'm used to being able to print to the tree, and I said, okay, how do I print this tree? Where's the print function? Unfortunately, there is none. The best explanation I found was write it to JavaScript and then use a D3 function to read it. I don't know D3. I'm not jumping through those hoops. Uh, and I'm not writing this to JavaScript. Uh, just to get a pretty output. So if you need a good output, eh, you're, you're out of luck. Again, it's a new tool. Uh, this is slightly better, but again, I had to hand do this. If you had 100 features, you'd have to do, you'd have to turn this into some kind of string replace loop. It'd be very, very cumbersome. To do. So one question. So, so what are some of the hyperparameters you could? We're going to look at that. That's okay. great. Uh, so, uh, the nice thing is that this is going to work on huge amounts of data. It'll do predictions fine. It's just not going to output something pretty. So if it's going to run in production, you end up not caring what the rules are. You end up not caring what the visual looks like. But it'll build a really, really accurate model that'll work at scale, uh, that'll work in a distributed fashion. So that's the big advantage. So let's check our model accuracy. So again, we didn't have a training set and a test set. We just did it in all of it. Uh, but it's actually pretty simple to find the accuracy. Uh, we just find the features and the labels, and then we do some predictions with those features. Let's get predictions, and then we just say, hey, when they're not equal, when V does not equal P, when our uh, the value doesn't equal our predicted value, count it. So this is just a count divided by the total. So this is our errors in our numerator and totaled in the denominator, and we printed 25%, 26% error rate. And that was for a model we didn't tune at all. Uh, so that's pretty good. It's better than flipping a coin, uh, certainly. Uh, but let's say we overfit it. Let's say we change those parameters. So now we're going to do 15 mins and a depth of 13. Uh, so we're going to have a very, very uh, deep tree, and we're going to have lots of splitting and categorization of our continuous values. And if we do that again, we count our prediction, we get a prediction error rate of zero. So this is extremely overfit. Because we have this tree that is so deep, we're getting every specific person in every specific case. And if we can ask 15 questions, we can narrow it down to every single case of that data that we have. Uh, so if we look at it up here, if we ask 15 questions, divide them into 15 bins each, we're going to get very, very accurate numbers. But it's not going to be generalizable. So this is where you want to make sure you have a training set and a test set to prevent that kind of overfitting. If anyone ever tells you they get 100% prediction, they get an ROC of 99, uh, they probably did something like this. It's a pretty common error that they make. Um, or they're lying. That, that also. So uh, that's the end of the notebook. And again, this is up on GitHub. Uh, for everyone to access, you can access the data. Uh, 
validation? Yeah, so there's ways to do that in ML. Uh, but uh, two things. I don't I, I did I left it out uh, in this example. Also I found that in big data examples, if you have uh, like two million rows, cross validation ends up not being that important. Cross validation is really important with small data sets. If you have 200 values, then cross validation matters. If you have 2 million, cross validation ends up being a lot of extra work that's really good rigor and very little value. Um, it is to get rid of outliers and weird behavior. At 2 million rows, you're not going to have that. Right now. But yeah, there are always. Any other questions about the notebook? Yeah. So if you had two million rows in that thing, then this code would look exactly the same, right? And yeah. And this, the Spark engine underneath is keeping all two million of those rows. And you're just seeing the pieces that, that are being projected out mm -hmm. in the Python notebook. Yeah. Here, right? You're not you're not yeah, we're not going to do a yeah, print of two million rows. You know, how do I keep the difference between what's being sent to the web page and what's being on the Spark system? Yeah, so how to keep the notebook the same regardless of data. So just be careful on your prints. Don't do like a print all or collect. Uh, but if you do like a take five, you're okay there. Uh, you just print five rows. Uh, and the, the really nice thing about Spark is there's no need to port it for larger data sets for production. When we do that CSV read at the beginning, here, it happens to be 500 rows, but it could be 500 million rows. It really uh, doesn't change the code at all. Uh, there's going to be things you want to do to optimize it with that data that size, uh, especially like repartitioning after wide operations. But for the most part, it ports really well for larger data sets. And then there's some back end things you want to do. So here I only have two executors. You don't want to do 5 million rows or 2 million rows or 2 x. It would take uh, too long. But you can scale it up. Uh, and Spark works pretty well. I want to say about 3 to 4,000 nodes. So you should be fine on 5 million nodes a day. But for example, the, the thing where you said 2. two oh, yeah, 2 pandas you don't want to do. That would be uh, one. It'll actually end up truncating it. So here we see that there's some truncation where it shows the first 30 okay. and the last 30 but rows. Would the Pandas data, the Pandas data frame there actually have the two million things in the notebook? Uh, no, it, it does like a, it keeps you from making stupid mistakes and printing everything. It says, right, we're just going to print 60. There's probably an argument in two Pandas that you can change that. Yeah, 60, but. You can also just say like limit and then two Pandas. Yeah. You know, or sample, sample, sample your, your you know, two million row data frame or RDD to get a small number of rows and then convert that to Pandas so that the notebook is not getting sent, you know, gigabytes of data just so you can show a few rows. Yeah, that's, you can do that. And there's a nice function here, uh, if you go into edit, where you can save it as just a Python file. So you get rid of all the markdown and things like that. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about how you make the model, your prediction on uh, whether there are hard disease or not, only on this one? I mean, if there is another column, like a whether smoke or not, well, so, so will there be any difference? So the prediction is just this model, the predict method on that model we built, and it just takes data uh, as an argument without labels. So in this case, we're mapping it to just so like if you added a new feature column, it would automatically pick it up. So like if we added a new, you know, uh, no, we throw you an error if you added a new Okay. It has to be the same set of features that we had before. Okay. But I mean, if there is another column in the original data that is whether smoke or not, it's only also two options. So for the addition, it will still be. Yeah. So it has to if the training set has a continuous variable smoking or tobacco, the prediction or test data set needs to have it be in the same format. It's really just doing a big substitution problem. It's substituting every row of data, those features, into that decision tree model. It's sort of running it through if this, else, if this, else, if this, else, and then making a prediction on every row. 
So label point is a function that we mapped here. So we took in the argument x, so this is just a row of data. And the way we had formatted it uh, up here is heart disease was the first value, so that's our first value, mm -hmm. our label, and then an array of features is what it looks for. So in this case, x1, 2, and so on. So if we turned it into an array. So that's the label point function. Uh, I think I have the link to the documentation have with column. It should be in there. Uh, if not, just Google label point spark and we'll pretty right to that. So yeah. once once you have a model, um, I think this was covered in the last talk also. This do you need Spark to run the model, or can you export it out and? It's um, <coughs> a good question. You you should be able to export it because it was just design rules. It's like if then, so that'll work in Python. Uh, you should think about using Spark in production. If you build the model with Spark, it'll work great in production. So I'd say keep doing. It. Um, what else would you want to do with it? If I just want to predict, so for training, I require a lot of memory, a lot of horsepower, right, to create mm -hmm. the model. Once the model is created, I don't necessarily keep want to keep the cluster running. We are a startup, we can't afford a lot of machines. Um, yeah, I guess you could export it and do it on like a desktop. Sorry. What's the format? Export the format. Um, you could write it as anything. You could probably write the model as anything. I think there's a new feature um, yeah. to uh, yeah. for exporting a common format. Oh. One which is JSON. So I think that that is a gap though. Two, oh, there's a new feature. Uh, not being able to export all models. Well, uh, it could be something else. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. Forget this. Wouldn't it would be possible yeah. to yeah, so that uh, might be run the demonstrations, demonstrations on IBM hardware by you know for regular people around the world? Oh, um, so you can install it on a local machine if you have Spark installed. If you do want to use the IBM backend, uh, you can get a 30-day free subscription uh, on Bluemix. You could also pay for it. It ends up not being that much. This example probably would run you 40, 50 cents, somewhere around there, because uh, it's about, I think it's about 20, it's 20, 40 cents an hour, and this demo is not too big. So as long as you remember to turn it off afterwards, that's the important thing, is don't just let the service run, then it should be like pennies an hour, like about 40 cents. Uh, but you can get a free account um, for 30 days. And that'll limit you to two executors, uh, but adequate to run examples. Uh, you could also run it on uh, Databricks' as cloud services as well. There's, it's the same thing in here. So there's some Spark there's no on another to, machine. So you can do it there. There's no book or just run on Databricks? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. There's the one tricky part is we use local file storage. I don't know if Databricks has any file storage associated with theirs. Um, they have their own version. Yeah. So, so they probably not compatible. I don't know what they are. You could try. It would be very easy to port. The big thing is just that first file read of the CSV. Yeah. That's the only thing that would be different. But all the, the functions are the same. And this is in Spark too, so it should run on there. So could you speak a little bit to the efficiency of? Uh, by Spark versus Scala. Let's say you have a Greenfield project. Um, you want to do some ML. So I was just looking at holding some of her slides by, by Spark, and still seems to be not as fast. There's a lot of overhead. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Spark is written in Scala. Scala is always going to be faster. With a lot of the data frames things, it gets really close. I would say the bottleneck ends up being right what you're uncomfortable in. Don't learn Scala just to do this, if you already know Python. If you already know Scala, don't learn Python. Uh, I would say that just go with what you're comfortable with. The time isn't too big. It ends up being just weird tuning things that like a data engineer will sort out uh, in the end. Uh, if you are concerned with efficiency and tuning, uh, there's usually repartitioning in Python will end up getting, or caching at the right place, it's gonna end up getting you faster than not doing that in Scala. So it ends up being sort of little things. 
uh, that matter. Python I like more because of some of the other library <coughs> stuff. So if I do need to do something with uh, a pandas function, I have that. The rule of thumb I heard from, from uh, some folks at Dailbricks was the more you use data frames, the less the performance difference matters between the languages because all of it is getting compiled down anyway. Yeah. You know, by less Spark optimizer. We don't have the difference yet. Yeah, of course we, we do. do. Yeah, we've had since Spark 1.3. I have a slide. No, you said. Oh, the ML methods he's using. Spark ML. Right? ML lib. Yeah, no, yeah. ML, Spark ML. There's ML, ML lib by Spark, yeah. but maybe not this particular oh, function, this algorithm, oh. but everything else, I mean, I'm using logistic regression know. and the full ML pipelines, and it's all in Python. So does the, the, the Scholar uh, leverage like glass and all that kind of stuff? Uh, probably, yeah. All the, all the stuff under, under the sheets that under the I, I wouldn't I would have known about that. But for another another cool thing about Python that maybe some people might not know is that you can actually run PySpark on PyPy. Uh, I don't know how many people know what PyPy is. If you have a lot of in intensive code that runs in the Python interpreter itself, that's not in, in the data frame, though, that Spark won't know how to optimize. You can you can select PyPy as your interpreter instead of C Python, and you're gonna get the magic of PyPy there. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> okay, I just have a couple more slides. So where to go from here? Uh, so I talked a little bit about this earlier, but you end up not making a lot of decision trees, uh, but they end up being a great foundation for more complex things, such as random forests. So I wouldn't say do random forests until you're comfortable with decision trees. But then if you start doing random forests, it's always better than decision trees. It's more computationally expensive, but uh, it's a good foundation. Uh, and then there's also boosted trees as well. And then the best thing you can do is try this with your own data set. Try writing your own code from scratch. That's going to be the best way to get better at this, uh, rather than uh, reviewing this demo uh, or buying some book or anything like that. So the code you're writing was not too much. You should be able to plug in your own data set, plug in a function to split the data, and then uh, clean the data up a little bit more. Uh, definitely don't just run it raw. You probably want to do some uh, substitution and some normalization. Uh, but try it with your own data set. And that's about it. Uh, so I just have my contact info there if you need to get in touch with me. Uh, I'll stick around for questions. And if anyone has questions, you can keep asking. And I'll stick around after the talk. Um, any other questions? All right, let's thank Joe for okay. the Thank you. Um, I booked the room until I think 9.30. Uh, the Cubs game starts about 15 minutes. <laughs>